Nasiris number 14, sharing session for the asynchronous and synchronous uh, ways of teaching. So today we have uh, three presenters. We have uh, Prof. Dr. Chiu Kang Sheng, and then we have uh, Muhammad Azuri Ali and also Mr. Muhammad Farid Atan. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Khan uh, for inviting me uh, to to get what what we call it uh, to have a sharing session uh, with you guys. Uh, at first, I think uh, rasa macam tak layak duduk di sini because I I just uh, joined Unimas like uh, five years ago uh, in drama and theatre uh, department. And here I am uh, sharing with you guys my experience, uh, what I did in my class. And uh, uh, when I asked Dr. Dayan Azra why I mean, uh, they choose me to talk at, or to have a sharing session today, just because uh, my article uh, in Insight uh, titling uh, Non Face to Face Drama uh, The New Normal in Teaching Theatre. Uh, first of all, when we talk about drama, you know. Uh, it's really hard for us to digest. Uh, is it is it a thing or is it is there a drama in higher education? Uh, why they, uh, what did they teach? Uh, okay, after, for especially for my uh, for my mom. Okay, uh, always argue with me. Apa you nak belajar? What kind of drama you want to create? You know. So uh, and also that's the thing that I have to convince my uh, my students, you know, why, what is the importance of drama and why and how this course, uh, how uh, this program can, can develop them uh, as a human. All right, so uh, my topic today is more on uh, my sharing session, okay, uh, non-face-to-face -face drama, uh, the new normal in teaching uh, theatre. As you guys know, uh, drama is a very heavy, uh, or theater itself is a very heavy uh, a practical approach to it okay and when it comes to pandemic uh, time uh, i think i bet it one year one year ago i guess uh, it's so hard and it, it really hit us in, in drama and theater program in uh, unimas because uh, first uh, we never experienced this before you know how we want to teach acting uh, using this new normal you know uh, i i i also have a class a name in which i want to uh, i want to share uh, in detail with you after this it's a class a production class required uh, the student to come out with a, a theater production you know you can see I I, I uh, choose personally choose my background today. Uh, our experimental theater uh, in FSDK. Okay, if you guys never been there, this is uh, experimental theater, the first experimental theater in Borneo. All right, and still the best in coaching and in Borneo and for uh, higher education uh, uh, place lah. So this is uh, this is where we do all the stuff. Right, students have to come uh, to this space and do the productions and learn how to manage, learn acting, learn directing. This is the space. So now when we switch the thing, uh, switch uh, uh, the, what we call uh, learning uh, or switch the class into an online session, that's, that is the, uh, what, what we call it, that is the challenge that we face. We in the drama and theatre department, we have uh, six uh, lecturers, and, and I, I can see there's some. Uh, there's a Chief Muhammad Kolim here, one of uh, my colleagues, uh, and that is the thing that we have to and um, we have to uh, be creative. How we want to teach a student in this kind of uh, situation. All right. So if you guys have any question, uh, you guys just can stop me and ask a question or i don't know where is the chat area here because i'm i'm not really familiar with webex uh so this is me my name is azri ali uh, from faculty sini guanaan and creative and uh, i'm currently a coordinator for drama and theater program in unimas all right uh, we have uh, almost 130 
32 or 35 students here in, in drama and theatre program now and six lecturer and uh, if you never heard of our program uh, please I will, I will promote my program here as well you know uh, we just uh, won a THA award on excellent in art excellent in art uh, I think excellent in art it is excellent in innovation in art, something like that. So uh, for uh, THE last year, uh, for a musical uh, called Samara Petiwi, which I am the director of the play. So uh, so we have a, a plenty of stuff going on here down in uh, experimental theatre and uh, drama and theatre program. And inshallah, uh, we will try to give more, uh, you know, and involve more of uh, our student in the industry and is it I know is it hard for us because the theater industry is not here in Kuching I have to create it and uh, now we we try to bring people uh, it's easy it's very easy nowadays because we're using online so I just can call my colleague there in in, in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur and we have an online session so so before we go uh, I talk more on and more on my uh, my class, right? So I would like to uh, give you guys and uh, just an insight. Uh, what actually we teach at uh, uh What is uh, the things that we cover at uh, What is the lesson our people or student learn in drama and theater program? Uh, when we, I know when we talk about or when you say drama and drama, we always remember Pukul Tujo punya drama, right? Uh, uh, TV3, Samarinda uh, and all that stuff. Uh, but we don't teach that here, okay? Don't worry. So what we teach here is, uh, first of all, is acting, all right? Uh, acting, uh, we show or we teach students uh, how to act using a, some sort of theory and also we teach uh, designing. In theater, uh, we, we divide it uh, for acting. The student just focus on acting itself. But for designing, there is some, uh, there's a course that teach students how to design a stage. All right, I'm sorry. And also we teach uh, how to manage uh, a production that also can be used later in the students, uh, you know, after they graduate, they can use the skills, not only, uh, to produce a production, but also in whatever field they're involved after graduating. Uh, so we teach them managing the production, all right? Uh, and I heard from my colleague or, or me, myself, uh, I'm a drama and theater graduate from UITM and we have that kind of, a, we have a very tough, uh, you know, uh, approach, you know, to, 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 to deal with uh, the production. and. Here we teach student student how how to manage uh, the production properly. So we, usually, what we did is uh, there's a class, uh, second year class. Uh, they learn how to manage the student. Uh, oh, sorry, how to manage the production. And this class will have a crisscross uh, session with uh, year one student who in an acting class. So they usually manage an acting class student, year one student actually, and work in a team and work in the same project, all right? And then also in drama and theater, we teach them how to direct a play, you know? Uh, directing and acting is uh, two things, uh, it's a very different, okay? It's, uh, it's not the same, directing and acting, okay? So directing is uh, more on um, developing the concept, all right? You, show, you lead the production, uh, using or, or uh, highlight highlight the day or, or what I can say uh, directing is more on picking uh, throwing your idea and make people do it all right and also we teach a script you know uh, how to analyze a script and also a production itself all right uh, so uh, what I really want to cover today uh, we I want you guys to see first uh, what is drama class all about and then when the pandemic come, right? after you guys understand how we uh, conventionally or, or usually uh, deliver or conduct a drama class, and then we see what happened after pandemic and how I use a synchronous and synchronous uh, way or approach in my teaching. 
and I want also want to share with you guys our final project, and uh, partly what I learned from this process, and 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 after this one year and a half, I guess we in online uh, mode. Okay, uh, there is thing that I re I learned from my student and learned from this uh, pandemic as well. All right. All right. So let's look at uh, drama class. All right. So drama class, usually we divide it into three sections. So there's a practical part of it, okay? And it, uh, most, of, most of it is a project uh, base, all right? And also there's a theoretical part of it, you know? So in practical, uh, so what we teach is uh, there's a set of class that need to have a one-on-one -on -one session, for instance, an acting class. So in acting class, usually what we do, we have a one-on-one -on -one session with the student uh, just to teach them uh, how to use their vocal, you know, how to use their uh, body, all right, how to use uh, the emotion and everything. Yeah. So that is a practical class. So they need to have a session in a studio uh, with the uh, lecturer. Okay, uh, talking about that, uh, that kind of class, we we usually have like uh, most forty students in the class. So it's kind of challenging for us to to give our our time to equally for each student. But uh, that is uh, the way uh, we teach. So student have to go in a studio and sit down uh, with the lecturer and also with the friends, okay, with the classmate and practice, all right? For instance, uh, there's a topic on how to use uh, your vocal cord or, or how, how to enhance your vocal. So they will spend hours and hours and hours in studio uh, just to get all to nail it down, okay, to get it right. So. So that is that kind of practical that I mean. And also, we also have a, a production class. A production class is mainly, uh, we do it in here, you know, uh, experimental theater. In this kind of production class, uh, student will practically uh, do all the thing uh, hands on, you know. Uh, in this uh, room or in this space, we have a lighting uh, a system that have to they have to learn, and they will spend uh, usually for drama and theater student, they will spend like hours and hours, days and night in this auditorium or in this experimental theater just to learn how to use the lighting board. So and and just to learn how to design or how to get uh, the mood right using the lighting provided. So. And so this is the class uh, I uh, highlight yellow one, yang kuning itu. That is uh, mostly a practical class, all right? So oh, there's another class that I, I didn't uh, highlight it. But uh, most of our classes, uh, we need that face-to-face -face situation or we need that face-to-face -face session one-on-one -on -one or a lecture with a group of people and we show them and they have to practice it. So this letter will become a problem for us, how we want to implement this during a COVID era, you know, during the pandemic. And also uh, in drama and theater, we also do our final project, all right. Uh, usually for year one, year two and three, we will come out with the same project. You know, we have one project, but uh, maybe three class will uh, work for that project. So they com we combine all of the people, uh, all, all of the students. And for instance, there is uh, some, uh, I think last two years, we combine with cinematography program uh, to do uh, our final project. So uh, at the end or towards the end of the semester, we uh, or my student will produce uh, a production, a play production, you know, it can be a musical, it can be a drama, it can be anything, a realism play, anything. 
So uh, as long uh, my our intention is to get them to work together with other people, you know, and then uh, so this is uh, some of it, you know. Uh, for Mimpi, you can uh, see the posters over there. We actually work with uh, uh, I think chemical uh, engineering department. With Mr. Haruna at that time, so we worked together, uh, and uh, from there, Mr. Haruna, Mr. Haruna drew uh, a final project for for his uh, for his engineering students to come out something for us uh, on stage, uh, like a design design uh, a robotic uh, stage uh, or uh, a moving sta uh, stage. So that that's our fi uh, that kind of uh, final. Uh, Mr. Haruna do and for my class we manage the production and also another class uh, acting class they act in the production so I involve three class uh, usually we will involve several classes also we invite music people uh, for music department music program uh, to join and do the final project with us all right so this is kind of uh, what happening uh, before COVID time you know, we work together among uh, the department sometimes I will invite people from the outside uh, to join the production and to give a uh, more uh, perspective on the production. And also we have a theoretical part uh, in the uh, production, all right, uh, in the theater. So this is part of it. Uh, that, uh, we, we learn how the post postmodernism, the history and all stuff. So before they can jump into an acting. So and how we assess all of uh, this uh, uh, final project, our our assessment, huh, and and the activity, how we assess them. So uh, we are very, we are heavily using an alternative assessment, uh, purely authentic assessment and performance based. Uh, what why I choose an authentic assessment is because uh, the student will uh, do the real production the real world problem they, they will deal with the real world problem they will deal with uh what they do here uh, right what they uh their uh, for instance the final project what they do uh it will be the same uh, with what they will face outside okay so even uh i will use usually i will make it harder for them and uh sometimes uh, i i am the one who create uh, the problem you know uh, Dengan sengaja, all right. Uh, purposely, I create a problem so that it's, uh, they will know or they will learn something. Because sometimes when sometimes there's a set of students they're very good in managing and there is no problem in the production. Sometimes I I will test them. I I create a problem that usually what pro, uh, what uh, happen outside in the real world or in the real theater production outside. Also, we have a performance base. This is for an acting uh, directing class uh, for this performance base usually for for instance uh, in in acting okay we want the student who, to come uh, to come up uh, with a monologue and they have to achieve our our standard and they have to you know we, we don't we don't judge or we don't assess their uh, the final uh, uh, outcome you know when they perform that is part of the marks but usually how we assess we look the progress because every week for instance a directing or acting student every week they will present their progress to the uh, uh, lecturer lah, you know? every week for instance there's a monologue they have to work out so every week in class uh, the lecturer will help them uh, to to deliver the monologue or help them uh to enhance uh, the potential so and lastly during the last uh week of semester uh, and uh they will uh do the performance and then uh, we will do the evaluation but that's that's only part of the marks uh, all right most of the marks come from uh come from the progress all right so this is uh some of my project brief okay we encourage my student uh, to do a e portfolio uh, to report what they do in rehearsal to record the uh, the you know the progress achievement sometime uh, the student uh, 
they have to just learn a line uh, called bersabarlah. You know, you, they will repeat, repeat, and repeat until they 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 get uh, the correct uh, rhythm, the correct uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the correct or you call it uh, objective for that line. So. Uh, they will document it in a e-portfolio. Uh, if we have time, I will share uh, one or two e-portfolio from my student after this later. All right, and then there you go. Uh, COVID nineteen uh, hit us last year, and during this time last year, uh, we already half of the semester, right? So usually, what happened uh, in drama and theater program? Half of uh, the semester, we already plan or we already have the program uh, sort out. You know, for instance, we already get the money for the production. We already design the poster. Uh, we, already, uh, we even we already buy the stuff uh, like uh, we buy the wood, the paint, macam uh, macam lagi. We already buy it, and then um, last last year. Uh, COVID hits us in the middle of the semester and it really a uh, hard time for us uh, and I also don't know what to do. You know, usually during that time, it's a very busy, uh, tra heavy traffic inside these people because people want to use this space uh, frequently and and we already planned everything, okay, at that time. So, uh, unfortunately, I have to post in my ellipse so luckily uh i have my ellipse uh always handy with me because during that pandemic uh the first uh pkp announced uh i was in my village okay because i say it like it's a school break so i have to send my 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 son to his grandpa for a week and it turns out uh, i was there for two months uh, with my son with my and with the limited uh baju baju semua so uh during that time i was not in samarahan i was away because i have to send my son for holiday and and then this pandemic happened so i uh nasib baik alhamdulillah the line in 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 my village is quite okay but uh you need uh, to sort out uh, sometimes you have to do it in the early morning so it's not heavy traffic uh using the you know internet at time so so i post in the in the in the in my elite all right so ask them to keep calm and everything you know uh, ask them uh because i also got uh messages or whatsapp or an email from my students what happened to our productions uh, we already do this we already spend money on this and that so uh it's quite sad but uh, i need to think uh, uh you know something to we need to do something you know production so we have to do that so yes unfortunately uh the production has to be cancelled so all the plan that we already is some uh we already planned it like a semester before and unfortunately we have to uh, obey um, the government uh, order and we have to cancel our show and then uh, the first week I, I received uh, arahan at that time and we will continue our class uh, full online if I'm not mistaken. So uh, thanks. Uh, luckily, I can get this back from my elite vault uh, and I can share and show you guys what I did. So uh, first of all, I, that is the first time we do it full online you know uh, from that a very practical production honestly at this time during the first week i also uh don't have any clear idea or any objective uh clear objective what i'm going to do but uh first thing i know uh i need to contact them and post in an elite uh my in my elite page that hey guys we will do this class okay we'll continue this class uh, uh, don't uh, disappointed about the production, but here go to elite page and we will do it through online. And then before I started, I come up with a rule so that uh, we are 
so that I can help uh, them uh, to understand uh, or they also can understand what needs to be done because we are both, you know, our student and us, dua-dua baru. We, dua-dua, uh, kita tak tahu what happened during the session. So, and uh, in my first class, I also don't know what I'm doing at that time. Uh, I'm very confident. We will do a class from two to six online, all right? First week, very confident at that time. So, uh, uh, so 11 June, we met and and it turns out now I know the problem, you know, when, when I open up the class for the first time, uh, because usually the class, we spend four hours for the class and more. Sometimes we continue up until the midnight to do all the production stuff because of because of this pandemic i also don't know uh how how to do what to do so uh i just go with the flow let's meet up guys and we discuss in the class and then uh and then all the class happen all right so uh, thanks to come with the several guide you know uh provided for us to uh to start uh, our, to, to, to start our class so and we need to do all the ptg again uh, and reconstruct our course and need to pick a new project uh, because uh, the project that we uh, plan we cannot do it anymore we cannot do a show in uh, experimental theater anymore so what we need to do so uh, then uh, i come out with this word asynchronous and synchronous i i phone tak tak berapa familiar at that time what kind of word is this and then now I'm really uh, nail it down. So we have, uh, and then I plan. Uh, I plan what to do during the asynchronous session and uh, synchronous session. You know, I, I, I do all the research. I look at, uh, come, uh, uh, thanks to PG Deep session, I really learned from it. I mean, hope PG Deep really helped me to, uh, uh, to show uh, or to share with me what kind of tools available in this uh, uh, internet that I can use uh, for my student and activities, you know. So, so what I do for asynchronous session. Uh, <clears throat> at first, uh, in the first week, uh, what I do is I try to combine asynchronous and synchronous uh, together, you know. Uh, so I have, uh, I use Zoom uh because at that time when uh, remember i was in my hometown in village during the pandemic the first week all right okay and uh we i know we have a webex all right uh i try webex because before the first class uh night before i tried webex with a couple of my students and it didn't work out and then i uh changed to zoom so I use Zoom and what I plan is I want to have, uh, you know, to give them first, uh, continue our learning unit, you know. So we continue uh, at that time, we have to learn about house manager. So uh, we continue. Uh, my plan is I, I'll give talks to them. You know, I give a lecture uh, like this. Okay, I don't know if it works or not, but I, I and then uh, for the that for the synchronous part, I just give and give and talk and talk. And then after that, what I did, uh, come out with a, a synchronous session where uh, they have to come out with a video or they have to read or watch some sort of video and then need, they need to send uh, something to me. Lah. And uh, so I don't know how I know it works or not. Every week, you know, every week uh, during after the week eight, that's, that is week eight up to week 14, all right? So I will have this column, you know, a feedback column. Yeah, uh, go back, you can see that under, I hope you guys enjoy this class in new norm. So first class feedback. So I ask them, ask my student, uh, hey guys, what you learned today? Share your, uh, share your experience, all right? Uh, is there things to improve? So uh, I'm, because I, I'm, I'm very open to any study, uh, any uh, comment, any critics, uh, because that's that's the way how I thought. Uh, it's a good, it's good to hear for them from them, you know. And 
and they come out uh, this is part of it i can screenshot uh, yeah ada lah yang loyal loyal buruk but some of it uh, you can uh, you can use lah you know uh, uh, mungkin uh, what i oh, you, what we can see here is some of them or most of them complain about the internet uh, change uh, which i can I, I cannot help them really but uh, and one of them asking me memperbanyakkan ruang soal jawab do got a lot a uh, uh, question and answer session or give them uh, because at that time i i don't know how to uh, conduct a session in a good uh, or in in a effective way so when i see this or next week what i do so i open up uh, a session just give them uh, time or give them uh, space to talk about uh, the production to talk about what they need uh, to talk lah okay and and then in answer in asynchronous mode i also make an activity as attendance for instance uh, so you can see i mark in a red based on the experience in my stage production for attendance today uh, write down the paragraph and uh, or draw, draw a flow chart it depends on each week i have a different activity to claim the attendance because i have to uh, my class is four hours so it's not fair for me just to talk and talk for one hour and for another three hours uh, there's nothing to do so i always come up with activity uh, for instance they do do infographic they will do some sort of uh, a flip grid video you know, you know? Uh, for, and, and currently uh, as we speak now i also have a class luckily we have this asynchronous session so i already made something from them uh, for them uh, last night uh, for uh, for attendance uh, today so and I come out and always go and search for uh, interesting activity, you know. But I found that uh, at some point when you use the same activity, people or students will get tired of it and they, uh, they don't know what. Okay? But when you have every week, but you have to work hard, you know, uh, when every week you come out with a new activity, you know, they will feel very, uh, you know, oh, ada benda baru. So, so that we motivate them uh, to join us in this uh, pandemic journey all right and also i make a, a clear instruction to them so during dua uh, bulan tak ada buat apa tu so i'm very bored at that time so i i edit a muka saya sendiri buka buat macam cartoon and then i use them uh, i use that uh, images and uh, interesting uh, colorful lah senang ni uh, colorful images and give them instru instruction uh, during uh, asynchronous session lah, you know, because sometimes I, I find that if you give a instruction just a, you know, just a paragraph or under the label, you know, under the label, you write it down and uh, sometimes my students miss it. But uh, what I did, I give one by one. So, okay, this is happening now. And then it, so it feel like they are reading a comic book, you know. Oh, and suddenly there is activity or task they need to do. So that is one of the way how I conduct a uh, asynchronous uh, session for my class. And also I also have a pre-recorded session. Okay, uh, this is from my another class, a stage role director. So I record it uh, using my uh, computer, and and also. Even though I already record it, I also give an instruction because uh, sometimes they, you know, student macam-macam kan. So they always come up with, dengan alasan, excuses, uh, ini tak boleh, ini tak ada. So I always have uh, that kind of images in mind, elite lah. So that uh, they feel very calm and nice to go to elite because uh, I know uh, they want to know what else next week. Encik Azri nak letak gambar apa lagi. Uh, so next week, apa uh, pula lah kartun je asin kita. So I always make them. Sometimes uh, during at the end of my lecture, I will ask them, uh, "Siapa dapat teka kartun apa next week? Uh, I will reward something, something like that lah." Alright, and uh, and also what I found in using a Zoom 
uh, 40 minutes is not enough for me. Even now, we already I'm already talking for uh, 34 minutes, and uh, and what I did, I personally believe lah Zoom too, so I can have all access, uh, full access to Zoom, and we can do a lot and lot of activity. All right. So. I record my session. I always change my intro. I edit my intro uh, to make it interesting. So uh, that kind of you know, sometimes student will menunggu nunggu what surprise for next week. Uh, what 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 uh, what is new thing I want to come out next week? So tadi tu iklan lah ya. Lepas setengah jam bercakap. Okay. So now uh, in a synchronous session. All right. So what I do? A class recording, you know, as usual. But I always record my class, and post it uh, using uh, YouTube. Uh, I post in YouTube and share the link in uh, Elite, as usual. And and I I also edit the session, my class, so by uh, you know, sometimes I cut only the important things. You know, yang merepek merepek tu, I cut it down. So I just go to the important part, so that uh, they don't have to wait or watch. Uh, il watch like one hour video of me, whereas I only talk about the class or talk about the learning unit for thirty minutes. So, so I just I personally cut uh, only the important important uh, learning unit or important uh, things that I will include in my class recording, uh, including. Uh, my my montage tadi tu lah, alright. So and this is another interesting uh, aspect. Uh, after we finish the first class, uh, the first sorry, out after we finish the first semester at uh, the half semester that we go for online, uh, I promise to my student uh, because after they taking theater production one, they need to take theater production two, okay, also with me. All right, so I promise them. Okay, guys, next year in theater production too, we need to do a production. All right, so uh, after long uh, break, I I come out with an idea. All right, so I know now how to do a production, uh, during an or or, or during an online uh, time. Because I already at the time saya pun dah pulang atau uh, I already back in Unimas and uh, already masuk kerja and uh, we all of us already need to go to the office. So I have access to this room, you know, to this uh, experimental theater. So what I do, uh, I try to create or I try to do an online or recorded uh, production. You know, while my student, uh, uh, my student in the slide, you can see uh, the, uh, the zoom screen. Uh, so it's not a screenshot; it's actually a projector uh, in the in the ET. All right, well, they will manage the production from where they are. You know, some some of them uh, in in uh, in Sabah in KL so. During the record, uh, we record the session like mon uh, this is a monodrama. During monodrama session, so I will uh, turn on my Zoom, and then my student will come in, and they will do all the production job. Uh, for instance, uh, my stage manager, stage manager is the one who give all the cues. Uh, 
my stage manager is in Sandakan. Uh, is or oh, I think in Sandakan. So she uh, she gave a cue ataupun bagi arahan form fa uh, kepada orang kat sini. Kat sini uh, for this production, this is when uh, case tak ada lagi. So we are allowed to have a sort of a small production in ET. And then uh, yes, I I can have production, but I don't have my student. So what I do, I bring my student into the room using my phone uh, as the uh, a main uh, you know camera. I show them. All right, guys. So we let's we do a mock or uh, let's we do a recorded production. So uh, for this uh, particular show, uh, I invite uh, my friend uh, to act in it, and then uh, and my student manage it. Okay. So we also have an online rehearsals now, all right? Now we really advanced. We know how to do it now, and I also have to uh, adjust my skill, uh, like uh, how to teach acting online, you know. And personally, they really enjoy it, and there's some of them uh, feel very funny because uh, you know lah, uh, again, kat rumah, they don't have a theatre background, and at some point they have to act. Or some point they have to menjerit, uh, do all the mom and mom homo, and then the uh, orang punya family pun dah terjebak sekali. <laughs> itu itu yang kelakar dia. And also as yes, production, uh, there's a directing class. For directing class, they also invite the parents untuk berlakon for the class. You know, the, the students very creative. They they ask uh, apa abang, adik, and some of the kakak to act in the the the, assess, the assignment it's really interesting and they record it so so uh, talking about our final project okay, i'm sharing you our my final so uh this is current uh just six to nine february uh, ago uh, what we do is we have we are having uh we were having uh, an online production on uh hero kita you know, so what we uh, hero kita uh, is uh, is tribute to our um, our frontliner, and they my student uh, teach. Uh, I I didn't teach them how to use wigs uh, doing a project, but they manage to to find a way to manage a show using a wigs and Google Drive. You know. And uh, for this particular production, we involve a uh, uh, acting student as well. And what the best part of it, we managed to uh, collect uh, uh, 4,000 something, 4,632, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that money we use, uh, we give back, uh, we help, uh, we use that money and give the money to Frontliner. Lah. So that's one of effort that my student do for that uh, theater production project. Uh, it's a very uh, nice effort of them. And this is actually their final project, you know. And this is actually what uh, happened in theater community now. They do online show, and this is the real problem they have to face, how to do all the uh, presentation and so on. All right. So this is the example, uh, how we meet all right uh, how uh, you can see my face and my friends Kawin there uh, and also anding so we invite anding to act in the production as well all right so yeah it's a very uh, unique way because some sometimes it's hard to get artists or practitioner to 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 go to unimas you yeah? know because our location here in samarahan but now with this online we can ask anybody, even we can ask my uh, our actors in Kuala Lumpur to join us in the production. So it's a very nice of, uh, there's a, a, another way to look at it. Lah. So I really use weeks uh, to to uh, monitor my student. Uh, and uh, if we have time, I can show you what they do in weeks. You know, uh, they report everything. Uh, they report all the rehearsal. You guys can see here just now. So this is in the, their weeks. So they report, they record all the rehearsal session and put in weeks. And I, I just go to, if I want to know the update on the production, I go to their weeks and see what happened, uh, what currently happened, what jobs already done and uh, what things need to be done and so on. All right. 
So uh, in this session, uh, in this one, what I learned. So I learned works very well in teaching. Uh, it's receiving feedback, as I mentioned before. Uh, always listen to your student, but uh, you know, ada ada hatnya lah. But the the positive, you uh, you know, you uh, know, what you think can make you become a good and uh, le uh, uh, lecturer or can have a good session, you, you take it away, uh, all right? And what else? Uh, both of us, students and lecturers, during this pandem pandemic, we need to work work together. That is the thing I implant, uh, implant in my students' uh, spirit. Uh, we need to work together to get this done, right? It's not, uh, uh, let's, uh, you know, some pardon lecturers and uh, because lecturers and students do, uh, jangan ni sangat lah. But because, you know, at, uh, lastly, my student yang cover, uh, yang discover how to use Wix, not me. So, uh, lastly, my student yang show me how to use this and this, uh, and, and this is, can you can do this for your class as well. So, I learn a lot from them actually. All right. And also, it needs a lot and a lot of creativity. Don't worry. Uh, practice will make it uh you, you just practice it just do it you know, you know what you feel right don't takut yeah for me i just langgar and do it as long my student uh, i can deliver and uh what my student need to know and so on and yes good teaching is one for preparation and three for is pure theater i get with that uh thank you so i'm open for any question uh that's all for me. Okay, so thank you, uh, Mr. Muhammad Azri. So we have, uh, do you have any question from the participant? You can ask directly to the speaker. So I have question uh, actually, uh, Mr. Muhammad Azri. Yes. So uh, how is the student performance before and after the pandemic? Okay, uh, the performance before before pandemic of course they they can uh what we say they can perform very well i think uh in for for example in acting okay uh, they can act very well but uh in, after pandemic during the online uh there is some obstacle that we face for example uh the space uh for for acting class they need a studio you know uh they cannot simply in their house lah kan uh, dalam bilik kita jerit-jerit, alright, shouting, wow, tiba-tiba jadi karakter, so nanti mak dia fikir apa pula. So, but uh, for us, uh, what the more important, the, uh, what matters for us at lecture is, as long dia punya tahap ataupun they understand how to get into that character or how to get into uh, that objective, we, uh, we are okay with that. So, but... After the pandemic, I, I personally, I have to say lah, uh, I, my evaluation become, I changed my uh, rubric a little bit. It's not, it's not the same dengan apa yang before pandemic, you know, because I know it's not fair to judge them uh, uh, sama macam, uh, same like before pandemic, and then after pandemic, with all this limitation, I think I need to change and see what I want to evaluate and that accommodate this kind of situation lah, okay. Okay, so we have question uh, from the chat room uh, from, I think, uh, uh, Chai Lisa. Uh, which app can I use to edit video for online teaching purpose? So any free application available? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the apps to edit the video for online teaching purpose. So any free application available? Because your video oh. looks very interesting. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, there's several free apps. Uh, so one, if you if you use uh, apa nama? Uh, iPhone user or user or Apple user, the iMovie is very simple. And in Unimas, we actually have a free access to uh, my uh, no Adobe Premiere. Okay, Adobe P R I M E Premiere. So Adobe Premiere is uh, uh, apps that Unimas already buy and we just we can use it for free 
So I don't mean we can use that to edit a video. Uh, it's very easy. And if you don't know how to do it, just type in YouTube what you want to do and YouTube will show you how to exactly do the editing. Lah. Uh, Adobe Premiere and uh, iMovie for Apple user. For your slide, is it, uh, what what software are you using? Oh, my slide, my slide always, I always uh, go for Canva. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Canva is the best for me now and it's easier. And even now I'm I'm sharing using I'm not using uh, PowerPoint I'm using uh, Canva. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have another one from Dr. Shazrina. So any future plan for Hero Tita Dua collaboration with other universities? Uh, come again, Dr. Dayan. Uh, any future plan for Hero Kita Dua? Oh, Hero Kita uh, Dua. Uh, yes. Any collaboration with other universities? Uh, yes, we have plan, but not with another university. We will do it with uh, industry player. Uh, we approaching it. Uh, we approaching uh, uh, popular or prominent actors in the country like uh, Namron or all the big big name to join mm -hmm. us in the pro online production. And currently, I or uh, I, I, we have a class we call theater management class. So they are the one who who doing it now. All right, so just maybe I will uh, ask them to promote it after we get a confirmation from the artist. And uh, with the same uh, objective, we want to collect um, uh, money and donate it to our frontliners, use the money to uh, frontliners. Lah. All right. Mm. And then uh, from Mr. Kawim Hamizan, uh, he, said, uh, he said that uh, you need to conduct a session on video editing. Ah, I will come to call you again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, YouTube mana? <laughs> so I learn also dalam YouTube actually. Because normally, uh, we just uh just put our recorded version on the online, uh, for the students, mm. no editing. So normally, uh, the student will always feel bored, right? Yes. So looking for your video is very interesting and then the student will be eager to look on your yes, what yes. is coming on to our like, next lecture. Actually, it's, like. it, it'll take you quite some time to do it because after you record, you have to download it to your, your PC and then you need to like half an hour just to cut all the necessary thing. Lah. And uh, actually my student is young Because when I uh, have a Aside asset assessment video presentation, and some of them really come up with a very nice uh, video. So I asked them how to do this. I can teach me. So yeah, I should, I also also learn from them actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, that's all from uh, the chat room. So thank you, Mr. Azri. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay. So we proceed with our next uh, speaker. Okay. So our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Muhammad Farid Atan. Uh, and then with the title Chemical Engineering POBL Implementation During the Pandemic, the Open Sources versus Campus Wide License of Way. Okay. So over to you, Mr. Farid. You can uh, share your slide and then you can uh, start. Uh, your session whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Dr. Azar, for the brief introductions. So let me introduce myself first. So I'm Farid from the from the Chemical Engineering Department, Faculty of Engineering. So I'm also the uh, coordinator for the integrated design projects that we call as a project oriented problem-based learning at the chemical engineering programs. So let me introduce, let me uh, give an overview of these projects. So in this current semester, this project is called as an integrated design project one and two. And previously this course has been named as a process design and chemical plant designs. So the number of credits is three plus four credit hours. And then this project uh, is implemented in the semester six third year studies and semester seven fourth year studies. 
So this project is considered as a compulsory project for the chemical engineering students before they graduated. It's the same level of in-depth of studies as a final year project. The difference between this uh, integrated design project with final year project is final year projects is uh, conducted individually. However, for this integrated design project or capstone projects is conducted in groups with four or five students per groups. That's depend on the number of students per cohort. And then in terms of the grouping method, let me explain in terms of the grouping methods. So the student uh, will not have the authority to choose their own groups. The grouping uh, was made by the, uh, what you call it, the uh, committee of the IDP department, of the, of the departmental IDP members. And then the criteria for the grouping is based on two, two, two aspects, which are the current CGPA of the students and the origin of that student, so that the student will have a mixed ability in, the, in that group, so that uh, we can have a good working with the with all average students. And in terms of the supervision methods of these capstone projects, is quite different. Uh, if, if we compare with the final year projects, because in the in these capstone projects, we have two types of supervisions, one from the academic peoples and the other one from the industrial peoples. So for the academic peoples, we select based on the uh, area of expertise. For example, if the like, that lecturer is expert in the material balance, so he or she will only evaluate and advise the student on that uh, appropriate sectors. However, for the industrials, we assign two groups for one, we assign one industrial supervisors for two groups. That industrial supervisors background come from uh, diverse uh, areas, such as oil and gas, uh, chemical specialties, uh, or others. And then most of the industrials uh, supervisors that we appointed uh, mostly come from our alumni, and then the and only some uh, are appointed based on the on the networking that the departmental have currently. So these are the overview, a uh, brief overview of uh, the capstone projects that we implemented at our department. And then in terms of the of the of the skills that we evaluate in the in this capstone project, so we have five categories that we look into when we implement these capstone projects. The first is we will evaluate the ability of the chemical engineering student to analyze complex engineering problems that uh, meet the cognitive level five. So when you before the students graduate as a chemical engineers they need to undergo these capstone projects where they need to uh, incorporate what they have learned in the first, second and third year studies in order to design the, the most appropriate process and chemical plant design. And then once they have analyzed the, the complex engineering problems, they need to come up with the solutions in order to solve that complex engineering problems that also related to cognitive level five. So once they have designed the solutions, the appropriate solutions for that complex engineering problems, so they need to evaluate the impact of their designs, the impact of their design in several aspects, such as economy, environment, and safety. So this will test our students' evaluation skills. And then in the, the four aspects that we look into, which is the project management and financials. So in these items, we look into the ability of the students in managing the projects, in managing the members or the human resource, and also in managing the capital investment of that projects. And then the other, the other aspect that we look into is the work in group, which is teamwork as you, as, uh, as you know that uh, the future engineers uh, need to know how to work in teams because they cannot uh, execute the project individually when they work in the company. So they need to know how to work in groups. So in this aspect, we look into how they communicate with their team.
team members in order to achieve the same objective. And the end, and and then the at the final stage, once they have finally and successfully designed or solved all the engineering problem related to these capstone projects, they need to do the reporting, either through written or either through oral presentations. So this assessment, uh, we 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 give us the overview of our students' ability in defending their ideas or their uh, their ideas in designing the process and chemical plant designs so these are the what get what can i say is the the aspect that we look into when we evaluate the students after the uh, during the implementation of the capstone project and after the implementation of the capstone projects so when they do the capstone projects, they need to undergo several aspects. So let me explain uh, briefly about these capstone projects. So the student will get will will put in several groups, five or uh, four or five members per groups, and then they will assign a topics. We give only the topics. The topic is based on the product of the chemicals. For example, the production of the acetic acid production of the ammonia and so on. So based on that topic, they need to come out their own design and they, they, they need to evaluate their designs. So first come to first, they need to do the market study in order to evaluate the supply and demand of their products and then followed by the chemical reactions. So in these chemical reactions, the student need to incorporate what they have learned in several subjects such as organic, such as analytical, such as uh in operation because they need to scaling up the process because if you know that in the literature most of the chemical action was in the laboratory scale so they need to scale it up to the industrial skills so when they have finished uh, this chemical action then they undergo with the modeling and simulation by using any appropriate software and then once they finish this part they will undergo to piping instrumentation diagrams mechanical design the requirement so this, until this part, they are uh, solving the complex engineering problems, which is equivalent to the cognitive level five. So once they finish uh, solving and designing and designing the chemical related problems, so they need to evaluate their designs. So in this case, they need to do the process safety and environmental impact assessment by using all the act and rules uh, regulated by the local authorities, such as the, the Departmental of Environment or the NRB for the Sarawak. And then after they done the evaluations in terms of the safety and environmental, they need to do some project feasibility analysis. They need to know how feasible their project is. They need to they need to determine the return of investment and the payback period of their projects. So these are the elements that the that the the student uh, with, uh, executing for these capstone projects. And then let me this let me explain about the what what happened before and after the pandemics. So before the pandemics, the face to face uh, discussion was conducted during the allocated uh, times as been uh, assigned by the department. So during that time, we have the monitoring face to face discussion. So I'm as a coordinator of the capstone projects, I will sit uh, I will sit in that groups uh, during the discussion because the purpose of that monitoring discussion, uh, monitoring group discussions, because we want to see how the students interact with each others, especially how the students initiate the discussion, the topic of the discussion, and how they debate and how they, def they defend their ideas during the discussions. And then once the pandemic and once the MCO have been enforced, uh, I think uh, last year, uh, March in 2020, so everything need to move from the uh, physical discussion to the online discussion. So we need to fully utilize ELLIPS. So we create a forum for each of the groups. And then uh, we will monitor the, 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 the involvement of each of the students during the forums. We will see how how much uh, topic have been created by that specific students and how much uh, response have been given by that specific students. 
And then we also create a forums between the students and the academic uh, supervisors. So for example, we have the chapter one with under these lecturers. So we want to see how the students interact with the supervisors. So the function of the, the role of the supervisors here will not give the answers. So the role of the supervisors is will guide the students in order to, 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 to let the student think what is the correct uh, uh, answers to their inquiries. So these are the, the group discussions from the before the pandemic and also after the pandemics. And then we move to the oral presentation. So we did you uh, we used to have the face to face oral presentation before the pandemics. And then once the, the MCO has been enforced, we need to move uh, from the face to face oral presentation. We move to the online oral presentation, either through WebEx or either through MS Team. The platform is based on the preference preference of the industrial advisors. So during the oral presentation, the student need to define needs to defend the ideas, need to defend all the all the design element, and then the student need to answers all the inquiries addressed by the industrial and also by the academic panels. So the good things about this online oral presentations, we can really evaluate student by students because we can see how the students put an effort to answer all the all the related uh, questions addressed by the panels and also online oral presentations give us the opportunity to appoint the industrial advisors from any locations for example uh, before pandemic we did we need, we we used to have the face to face oral presentation during face to face is quite difficult to to appoint the panels because the panels may come from the west malaysia or may come from outside kuching so the time is not uh, the timing sometimes not uh, not uh, what we call it uh, not match with their availability so however for the online oral presentation we no need to 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 move uh, we call it the, the industry no need to come to the campus so what we do is they can listen to the oral presentation from their office or from their hometown. So easy for us to, to, to appoint the industrial advisors and also for the industrial panels. So we give the opportunity for the students to, to get the inputs, the important inputs from the industrial advisors. And then in terms of the simulation software, like uh, I mentioned just now, so before the pandemic, we used to utilize Aspen ICS. Aspen ICS is a, what we call it the is the white campus license purchased by the departments. So the 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 problem with this Aspen ICS is the cost is very expensive, and then we only purchase fifty units of license. And then this type of software we need to install it in our departmental computers, and then we cannot allow students to install it in their own laptops. So during the pandemic, the student was not the student were not were not allowed to enter the campus, and consequently, consequently they are not able to access to this Aspen ICS. So we need to come up, we need to find out what is the relevant open source chemical open source software that close to the Aspen ICS. So finally, we find out that DW Sims Chemical Process Simulator is is have the closest properties as the Aspen ICS. So the difference between these two softwares is Aspen ICS managed to do the cost estimation, but not for DW Sims. But somehow the similarity of these two software is both of us managed to design the process, simulating and optimizing the process. So these are the differences between the campus wide license and open source license. So only the difference is on the cost estimations and then when we move from the from the op, uh, campus wide license to the open uh, source license we need to train back our students so my teammates dr hafiza uh, had organized uh, online training sessions where he need to train how to use the open source software he he need to teach the students from the scratch on how to uh, for example, to to 
to open the to to install the software to download the to download and to install the software and also to execute the software and then he she need, she need to 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 give some example or some case study in order to illustrate how the software is how how the software works and then how to analyze the results uh, generated from this software so in order to to assess uh, the understanding of the students uh, on this simulation software. So we did come up with the process simulation assessment. So there are two categories that we that we that we carry out. First, for those who are managed to install the software in their own laptops. And the second one is for those who are unable to 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 what we call it, to install the software in their laptops. So for those who manage to to install the software in their laptops. So the procedure is we give a, a what we call it the general uh, general questions which the student need to define their own reactions and then then from that own reaction they need to come up with their own vectors and then they need to define and uh, they need to find in the literature what is the correct operating operating conditions and then they need to to think about formulating their simulation step and procedures and then they execute the simulation process and then at the end they analyze and interpret the simulation results meaning that they need to fully uh, apply what they have learned with Dr. Hafiza during the online simulation trainings and then we need to consider as well for those who aren't able to install the software in their own laptop due to the uh, several reasons. Most of the reason is the, the 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 RAM capacity of the laptop does not support the software. So for this purpose, for the first uh for the first four step, still the same as those who are managed to install the software, such as define direction, select directors, define the operating condition, formulate the simulation step or procedures. But for those who 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 are unable to what we call that to to install the software so the instructor will set the online meeting through webex and then if you realize that in webex there are one uh, tools that uh that call as us to control where the student can uh, simulate the the application that we install in our laptops for example if we share that application through webex and then the student us to control tools and then we accept that us to control so the student managed to do the simulation that have been installed in our computer and then at the end the student managed to analyze and interpret the results i think that's all for me that i want to share regarding the the po pbl sharing especially on the open source and what campus what what campus license software thank you if you have any question, you can ask. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Farid. <clears throat> okay, so uh, do you have any question from the participant regarding the implementation of POBL? Okay, so what is uh, basically the difference between uh, POBL and also PBL. What is the difference? PBL. Why we need to have the POBL? I think the 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 difference is on the on the case study itself. So the PO PBL is really that uh, we try to relate it in the real scenario in the industries. For example, we give the topic for uh, such as the production of ammonia. So the student need to think how to design the 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 correct uh, for example the rectus uh, which is uh, more or less uh, uh, similar to those that have been used by the industrial peoples that's why we we, we engage the the industrial peoples during the implementation so that the student will get the clear picture how to how to do how to design and how to implement it correctly because if we we get the only the 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 what you call that the only view from the academic peoples, maybe they are more to theoretical frameworks, maybe they are more to theoretical parts. But 
in term of implementations, some part of the lectures might be quite might be different from the the what we learn in theory. That's why we really uh, engage the industrial peoples during the implementation of our POPBL, so that the experience that the industrial people has faced during the during the uh, working time, they can share it with the student so that the student know what they should do and what they, they shouldn't do during the design phase. So the student will be given the task is it individually or in group? So the student will give uh, the task in groups. So they give, we give only the topics. So it's a one year project, the same as final year projects. It's a one year project divided into two semesters. So, and then uh, we already define the, what you call it, the criteria for each of the chapters. So for this semester, they only execute five chapters. And then the next semester, they will execute another uh, six chapters. So at the end of uh, one year, at the end of that uh, second part, they already come up with the complete design of their projects. So can you give uh, an example how the report looks like and also how the rubrics of the assessment, everything? So the, the, the report is based on the chapters, for example, the introductions. So in that introduction, they need to, what you call it, to, to define their, their project scope and their aim of major team and so on, same as the final year projects. And then with the chapter two, they start to do the, the, the work related to the design. They need to do the market survey. They need to know the supply and demand of their products. For example, if they work on the ammonia, they need to know what is the supply and demand of that ammonia. And then based on that supply and demand of that ammonia, they need to determine the rate of production because the rate of production will influence the payback period and the return of investment of their projects at the end of the chapters. And then followed by the, once they determine the, the, the production rate, they, 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 they will uh, continue with the uh, next chapter, which is the reaction parts, where they need to come up with the reaction. What is the reaction look like in order to produce that products? The student will, uh, the student will uh, collect all the data re re related to the reaction and synthesis in the literature. The problem in the literature is all the scale is the in the laboratory scale, which is the product is produced in the gram gram scale. So now they need to scaling up the process. They need to scaling up to kiloton per year, for example. So they need to have the basic knowledge of engineering on how to scaling up that process. When they have managed to scaling up the process to the kiloton per year as been uh, set in the chapter two, so they need to do the simulation they need to know they need to simulate the process they need to ensure that the process is work correctly by comparing the modeling results and the simulation results when they finish the simulation and then the firm that the process is work well is work well then they need to do the piping and instrumentation diagram they need to build the plants at the industrial skills so at this level they need to consult regularly their industrial advisors because at the industrial scale industrial advisors have more experience compared to our uh, academic academic uh, advisors so uh, i just explained briefly so at the end of the projects they need to evaluate uh, in terms of the you need to evaluate the full designs uh, in several aspects first is environment aspect environmental aspects and then the second one is the safety aspect and then the last one the crucial one before they can conclude either the project is feasible or not is on the financial parts because they need to 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 them to 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 convince the panels that their project is feasible by showing the the indicator such as the return of investment and the payback period of their projects and then in terms of rubrics uh the rubrics uh is uh is designed based on the chapters for example each chapters we have the elements that, that that need to be evaluated and then the uh, uh, the student will be given the rubrics in advance so that the student know what area and which part of the design that need to be evaluated 
and that need to be studied in depth in, in order for them to to what you call that to to achieve the objective of that chapters and then in term of the grading uh, we still need to control we need we still need to make sure the the standard of the design so before we finalize the marks we get the final inputs from the industrial peoples either the design is up to the standard for a grades or up to the standard of b minus grade or up to the standard of the c grades so the how we 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 find that we grading the the final design of the students in order to ensure that if we get if we get if we give a for that specific groups meaning that the outcome of that design meet the criteria of the a grades that be that have been discussed with industrial and also with the academic so is it, is it the same with integrated design project yeah, integrated design project, yes. So this one is called integrated design project, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then at the end, uh, they need to, what does you, uh, what do you mean with the campus-wide license? Any specific so, license they need to install? Uh, for campus-wide license, uh, Aspens, we use uh, Aspens. Mm. Uh, so the problem with Aspens, the, the, the cost of that license is very expensive. So every year we manage to get only 50 units of license. And then this soft type of software, uh, we, we cannot uh, allow students to install it in their own laptops. So that's why during the pandemic where the students are not allowed to enter the campus, we need to find alternative way in order for this, in order to allow the student to simulate the process. So we, we do some research on the open source software. So when, when we do the research on open source software, we find out that DWSIM process the, what we call it, 80% similarity to the Aspen ISIS. So, now, so that's why we advise students to use this open source software for their simulation to replace Aspen ISIS. And then in order to, to ask the students to use this new software, we need to give a training to the students. So online training was given, and then in order to know either the student understand on how to use that software, we also assess the ability of students in simulating the software. We give several, the student need to choose different different versions. They cannot choose the same versions because we, not, we, not, we need to avoid the copy and paste uh, from one student to another student. So the student need to define different versions. So from that action, they need to execute. If they manage to execute, meaning that they get the results. And then they need to give us the procedure so that we as a assessor, we can re-simulate back. We take randomly students' uh, copy and then we try to re-simulate back. Either the, what they claim is correct or not. Okay. okay. I think uh, that's all for Mr. Mubafani. I don't see any question from the chat room. Okay, so thank you for the very insightful and informative sharing. Maybe it's quite difficult for other faculty to also implement the same uh, POBL. Okay, so thank you very much okay, for your uh, sharing. So next, we move on to Prof. Professor Dr. Chiu Kang Sheng from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So this is uh, his title, Zooming in on video conferencing applications used in education, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So over to you, Prof. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what I'm going to share. Um, basically, there are just uh, four points I'm going to share. Number one is the good uh, things about video applications. Uh, number two will be the bad or the ugly things about video applications. Uh, number three will be uh, the what uh, should be used uh, or should what the what the contents that uh, should be included uh, in video applications uh, particularly i'm going to talk about the use of a uh, lecture uh, putting lecture for video applications and what is the choice between uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning because when we talk about video applications basically we are uh, talking about synchronous right um, synchronous basically we use uh, one of the video applications either webex or other zoom or google meet uh, seldom we will use uh, WhatsApp and Telegram. 
Now, of course, the first thing I'm talk, talking about the, the good first. Huh? So I, I think uh, everybody knows that video conferencing app, application is a very con convenient. Uh, it saves money and it reduces the fuel consumption. So it's environmentally friendly. So we don't have to travel so much today. Huh? So I think um, uh, those of us who have, uh, for the last one year, we uh, know that we can attend conference that we never thought of uh, attending uh, in overseas, in uh, UK and US, and it costs us much less, right? Uh, the fraction of the cost uh, compared, to if you go there, you need to pay for air flight, um, and you may uh, need, you also need to pay for the ho hotels and all that. Eh? So the study has shown that uh, video conferencing actually uh, will use less than 10% of the energy required for an in-person face-to-face uh, -face meeting eh, because of the reduction of traveling. Right? Um, there are also some limited studies to show there are some benefits um, for people with social anxiety and learning disabilities. Uh, those people, um, um, it, it, it may be beneficial for them. For example, pe uh, people with autism. Um, in a real face-to-face -face meeting, there's too, too much noise that people keep talking uh, from every direction. Uh, so uh, sensory, uh, stimulation coming from everywhere, every direction. So those people with uh, autism, sometimes they are very hard for them to 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 uh, to differentiate the noise and the signals, right? So people with autism, they have difficulty in understanding when it's their turn to speak uh, in a live conversation, it's a face to face, right? and the predictability of the uh, uh, video conferencing uh, applications, like one speaker talk and the rest being muted and the frequent pauses between speakers. Um, so you know when you it's time for you to talk. Um, it actually helps for some autistic people, right? And people who have some uh, social anxiety, uh, video application online is uh, actually helps them to express themselves better. Uh, they may have some kind of social anxiety, phobia and so on, right? So these are the good things. Uh, it's convenient, it saves money. And for some people with uh, autism, it's more predictable, everybody muted, and it's time for you to stop, so it's a good thing, right? So that is the good side. Uh. Um, how about the bad and the ugly? I'm going to talk about four points here. Uh, number one is that there will be a very unnatural excessive amount of close-up contact, eye contact, yeah? Um, and I'm, I'm going to elaborate on this point. It's very interesting when I look at this also. Um, number two is that it's a very high cognitive load uh, of using video app, uh, conferencing, just like now what we are doing. I, I can't really uh, get all the non-verbal cues from everyone. I, I cannot see everybody. And of course, most people are off the webcam as well. And then number three is that looking at your own face can be very stressful. And <laughs> when I talk, uh, I'm looking at my own face. So what I'm going to do, actually, I also turn off my own, uh, put my, my own webcam on site. Uh, and then number four is that there will be reduced mobility, especially if you have long hours of video conferencing, you're just sitting down there for hours and hours. That is bad, actually. Uh, let me talk about the first point. Um, to give you an analogy, uh, you just remember, just look at people who are in an elevator. What happens when you're back inside an elevator? Uh, let's say you are inside and you see all sorts of reaction, but one of the very prominent things that you see that people look up, people will look down, people will look straight, but there will be no eye contact, right? Um, people are forced to violate a, a, a non-verbal norm, okay? When they have to stand very really close to each other. So what they do is that they will look away from the faces of one another, okay? Even though you may know each other also, uh, you will tend to not talking and also to look straight, look up, look down, or look at your phone, okay? So there's a trade-off between eye gaze and interpersonal distance. Right? This is called the Intimacy Equilibrium Theory, okay? Uh, by a, a paper that's quite long ago, 1965. But even in an em overthrow environment, uh, your own avatar, there's a study by Balanson at all in 2001. Uh, I also had that kind of experience. Uh, I've attended a, a virtual conference, and this virtual conference is uh, very special in the sense that you create your own avatar, and you actually enter into a virtual conference room. Uh, there's a, a, you can choose your seat, and when you are close to another avatar, another person, virtually, uh, you can actually check with that person. And you, it's, I feel even then, even in virtual platform, I feel very uncomfortable if my avatar is 
uh, if somebody's avatar is very close to my avatar, so I, I think even virtually we also feel very uncomfortable with strangers coming close to each uh, uh, close to one another, especially if that stranger's uh, avatar is looking at you and try to initiate a conversation. So that's the thing. Uh, this concept actually um, been expounded by uh, Edward Hall. Edward Hall is a, is a cultural uh, was actually was he passed away was a cultural anthropologist and it described uh, four zones. Uh, uh, number one, of course, your own intimate zones, right? And there's uh, people who are closest to you. And then there's this personal space, a uh, personal zone, space or personal zone, which is about uh, half, a, half a meter, right? So these are your close family member, your children, your wife, your, your spouses, right? Uh, then there's this social space, okay, from 1.2 to uh, 3.6 meter. And that's the reason why a social distancing is about two meter, um, following this concept here, right? Of course, uh, also of how the virus spread. No? And then there's a public space which is beyond the 3.6 meter. Um, so if you are standing very close to one another, you are actually uh, intruding into your own uh, personal space, right? And that's the reason there's a trade off, right? So in order to trade that off, so we, we try to avoid eye contact with one another. But unfortunately, in a in an online environment, really, uh, when when we are in a Zoom meeting, for example, everybody switch on a camera, you are actually looking at everybody is looking at one another. And um, this is something very unnatural, actually. Um, so before I continue, I just want to ask the questions. Uh, I can't see because I'm on a full screen. Uh, presentation here, but given a choice, uh, let's say you have a choice, totally you have a choice. Would you prefer to turn on your camera or turn off your camera uh, in a big virtual meeting? Uh, just by looking at the participants, uh, most participants actually turn off the camera. So I think that is the answers, right? Uh, if I'm given a choice, I will also turn off the camera because actually turning off a camera in a virtual environment is like looking away uh, rather than uh, Maintaining a constant eye contact and gaze uh, on one another, that is very feel make us feel very uncomfortable when you can see that everybody is looking at you. Um, so let's ask these questions to ourselves. If we ourselves also feel very uncomfortable when we have uh, turning on the camera all the time, uh, unless of course that you have to talk or you want to ask a question, then usually people will turn on the camera. Otherwise, usually we'll, we we as a lecturer we also turn off a camera. So uh, ask ourselves why do we uh, why do our students also turn off their cameras, right? Is it because our students, just because they are, they are very passive, or is it they, uh, turning off, turning on the camera also make them feel very uncomfortable? Also? If you're constantly on the camera, actually it can be very uncomfortable for them. Um, especially if you are inside your own personal room, you know, some of the students, they may have limited space, right? They have to do their uh, online classes uh, inside their bedroom as well. We have messy background, and therefore people usually put virtual background. But the problem is, if you put virtual background, it will also uh, tend to increase your upload uh, size, right? Uh, it 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 it, uh, it eats up a lot uh, a lot more bandwidth as compared if you use a natural uh, background. So I think this is a question that we should reflect and ask ourselves: uh, If we ourselves also feel very uncomfortable putting on a camera, why do we uh, need to uh, ask our students to? on the camera all the time. I usually don't ask the, the students to on the camera all the time. Perhaps maybe if you ask questions or during the beginning of the meeting, then we on the, on the camera. Right? Um, I'm gonna talk more about this later on, okay? So as I mentioned earlier on, in a typical group uh, virtual meeting, uh, video conferencing, either using uh, Zoom or using WebEx or whatever, uh, regardless who is speaking, all right? Every person is looking directly at the eyes of the other person and the faces close up, okay, especially if you are using the uh, speaker view or not the gallery view. Your speaker view, you, you can measure the, from the top to the chin, uh, you can measure how many CM, right? Let's say you measure the, the screen here, normal uh, notebook, uh, let's say it's about 13, 13, 13 CM, uh, uh, 10 to 12 CM. And then you, uh, in a real, you, let's say you see the real person again, uh, uh, face to face physically. And you try to stand, uh, adjust your distance from that person, if you are comfortable with him or if you're a family member, and you try to do this experiment, and you try to get the the thin CM back again, and you try to measure what is the distance, and you will find that actually it will be to create that uh, image size, you are actually intruding into that personal space, 
So that's why it's a bit uncomfortable sometimes, um, especially if you are on the camera and with the, all the big, uh, eye gaze. <laughs> so, um, one of the things is that uh, if you are being stared at all the time, right, even when you are speaking, it actually uh, very uncomfortable because it uh, uh, creates a lot of physiological arousal, right? It causes anxiety, it causes sympathetic, means like all your heart rate will go up, right? And those kind of things, right? There's an experiment done by uh, Target uh, 2009. Uh, even in a one to one physical meeting, people look at each other's face for less than half of the time, okay? Uh, by uh, another study done here. So we also don't look at each other even in the physical meeting all the time. But in a virtual meeting, you have no choice if you're on a camera. Um, in a physical business meeting, for example, most of the people actually are not looking at the speakers. Uh, they may look at other things, they may look at the computer, they may look down, uh, they may surf the internet and look and uh, do some online shopping while waiting for the speaker to talk and so kind of, kind of things. But uh, in a virtual meeting, it's a, it's a bit different. It's totally new actually for us. And for the last one year, we have been doing so uh, with the uh, video on and so on. Right? Um, and it's been shown that the amount of eye gaze uh, in Zoom or in any video platform is about eight times higher compared to uh, in a physical meeting, right? So the, the, thing. Um, the second thing is that um, in a video platform, it's also imposed a higher cognitive load. Right? Um, if you are familiar with Moravian's communication model, Moravian's communication model says that uh, in our normal face-to-face -face conversation, um, only 7% of the meaning of the words uh, is comes from our actual words, right? Only 7%. Uh, 55%, more than 50% uh, is coming from our body language, right? I would say our body language it sends the signals. For example, uh, you, are, uh, you are bored with my presentation and you're falling asleep. But in a virtual meeting, I don't know who is falling asleep, right? Uh, see, similarly, in, the, in, a, in a virtual meeting, we don't know who are the students that are bored with our our lecture or our sessions, right? But in a physical class, we can we can know who are actually bored. You can see the majority of the people who are bored means that it's time for you to stop for a while and do some other things or ask them to take a short break or go for a stretch, a toilet break and whatever. But in a in a virtual meeting, we, we are not able to, to judge that thing. Perhaps like, when you see people leaving, uh, that, is also, <laughs> that is also one of the indications in a virtual meeting, right? Um, uh, if you have a silent pause for some time, then it, is people listening or not? That's, that's the thing in a, in a, in a video conference. It be, it's very hard to get the kind of non-verbal cues, right? Non-verbal communication. And another 38% comes from our tone of voice, right? In a, in a physical meeting, in a physical conversation. But in a video conferencing uh, platform, uh, the tone of voice can be much affected by your gadgets, uh, your speakers, your internet connection. And, and so uh, it becomes very unnatural. Right? So uh, for example, users are forced to con consciously look out for non-verbal cues and to send cues to others that are intentionally generated. For example, if you want to agree, if I want to agree with somebody in a virtual meeting, what, 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 what else can I do? Can I, can I not? Yeah, I cannot, but I have to not uh, in a very exaggerated way in order for the speakers to catch the cue, right? Or you can see that now people are learning to do all this, right? Uh, all the thumbs up sign, and also there's also the emoji there for you to uh, uh, do the thumbs up. Uh, these are the things that will compensate for the loss of the non-verbal cues. Huh? Um, this is what we are, we are doing, but it's becoming very unnatural. Um, study has also shown that um, even the way we speak during a video call may be unnatural. Why? For example, a study by Crows et al. Uh, in comparing face-to-face -face interaction versus video conferencing, it shows that people tend to speak 15% louder when interacting on a video. It's no longer a natural voice. Uh, when I'm thinking hard, then I will tend to speak uh, speak a bit slower and softer uh, compared to when I'm excited, I will talk a bit louder. I, I will vary my tone of voice, right? But in a video, I have to speak loud and I have to be a bit slow. I hope I'm uh, a bit slower now uh, so that people will be able to catch the meaning behind, right? But 
So that is very unnatural, huh? again. And all these um, laws of the non-verbal cues make us want to catch the sickness from the speakers. And therefore, we have limited capacity to process the information itself. That's why it, it imposes a heavy cognitive load. Um, now, I want to ask these questions. I, I, I cannot see the chat box uh, because I'm on full screen, as I mentioned. Now, suppose you ask a, quest, a class question, uh, you ask a, 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 a question to your students in, in a video conference uh, application like Zoom, but there, there is a total silence from the students. How many seconds lapsed would, you make, would make you would, sorry, would make you feel very uncomfortable. Maybe uh, Dr. Azra, can you uh, let, uh, uh, help me to check, see the chat box? Is there any response? Uh, uh, can somebody uh, rest? You see, see, I have <laughs> asked a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, How many seconds uh, would make you feel very uncomfortable? From Dr. Shazrina, it's 15 seconds. Okay. Any more response? No more response. <laughs> okay. For 15, 15 seconds, so you have to uh, you wait for 15 seconds, then make you like uncomfortable, right? Now, uh, there was a study actually done uh, uh, by Schoenberg, uh, I, sorry, Schoenberg. Uh, Schoenberg in 2014, that was before the pandemic. Uh, she, she, they, they, did, uh, they did a study on the perception of transmission delay. Uh, uh, this is like, um, when your internet connection is also good, right? Over a phone conferencing app, it was found that a delay of just 1.2 seconds will make people feel that the responders are less friendly, uh, less cheerful, and less self-efficient. Even as little as 1.2 seconds, 1 to 2 seconds, I would say, uh, 1, 1 to 2 seconds, let's say 2 seconds, uh, you ask a question and no response from your students from 2 seconds, you are actually wondering whether they are actually asleep or are you talking to yourself? So I think this is the thing that is very unnatural. But in a real physical meeting, we know uh, 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 why they are not responding. Maybe they are thinking. Uh, maybe they, uh, uh, you know, they, they they are not paying attention. They are they are falling asleep and so on. But uh, in a virtual conference meeting, we we can't do that, right? The other thing is that social interactions are like humans actually are very uh, much dependent on uh, physical presence of one another, right? Our social interactions are actually associated with uh, neural circuits of rewards, right? We share jokes with one another. Uh, even a simple handshake, uh, a simple handshake, actually, will uh, a simple uh, pat at the back, a uh, simple touch, of course, appropriately, uh, will release the oxytocin and, and dopamine. And oxytocin and dopamine, for those who are not familiar, is, is, is a hormone that is associated with social bonding. Uh. Of course, in the uh, original context, is a mother and baby bonding, but it has been shown that uh, even our interaction with one another, uh, the the touch, uh, you know, it will uh, release uh, oxytocin and dopamine. And that's the reason why a handshake is so important uh, in a business deal, right? Uh, a good handshake means that uh, I trust you, right? It's a, it's a symbol of trust. But in a virtual conferencing, that you don't, you have, again, you have lost that, that uh, non-verbal touch. Right? The human touch is not there anymore. Uh, even functional MRI, uh, the MRI means magnetic resonance uh, uh, imaging uh, type of uh, uh, ima imaging. Huh? Uh, it, it, it reveals that live face-to-face -face interactions, uh, as compared to viewing uh, recordings, uh, video recordings, are associated with a greater activation of the reward center in our in our brain. Huh? Uh, these are the way it stimulate the release of dopamine, you know, and, and cause reward and cause joy, right? Uh, uh, in, in, in in our interactions, right? In, these are the areas of the brain. You don't really have to worry so much about that. Okay? But just to show that studies have been done to show that you know, in a virtual meeting with the loss of that human touch is uh, less rewarding as compared to in a real face-to-face -face meeting. Number three. Yeah? is that when we are look at each other's face, it's really very stressful uh, and it's very unnatural. Like now, I try, even I try to try to off my camera, uh, I, I can't, right? unless I, I, off my, uh, unless I turn off my webcam, right? Uh, even I try to push it away, it's still, I'm still seeing myself. But that is very unnatural because when you talk, uh, you don't have a mirror in front of you and you, you, and you talk to a crowd, right? 
But in um, video applications like Zoom, WebEx, all they have all these your own video cam in front of you. And looking at oh, our own face can be very stressful. Uh, Duval and Vicklin right back in 1970, they show that people are very are becoming more critical of themselves when they see their own mirror image, especially if you don't like your, to see your own self all the time. Uh, uh, Feja and Hall, if I pronounce the name correctly, they did um, a study, not, not a study, actually, it's an analysis of the study called meta-analysis, and it showed that there's some small negative uh, effect size when they see their own mirror image of themselves. And Ingram said that this problem has greater impact on female uh, versus male. So again, you can see that looking at our own face can be very stressful sometimes. And that's one of the reasons also why people uh, usually turn off the camera um, or at least some of the time, some, some of the time they're just turning off camera. I, I believe turning off camera, as I mentioned earlier, it is a way for us to look away from the, the, the constantly gazing at the, the speaker, right? Now, number four, the, the bad and the ugly things about uh, video conferencing, especially you have long lectures, uh, is that um, you generally have to stay on the same spot um, for a very long time, two hours, three hours. Uh, movement is very limited. This is very unnatural. Um, and study have shown, and there are numerous of study, I'm just quoting one of it here. If uh, people who walk around actually can come up with more creative ideas than people who are just sitting still all the time. And that's the reason why if you are very stressful and you cannot come up with any new ideas after hours of brainstorming, you uh, walk out of the room, you take the cup of coffee uh, and you look away and actually you, know, you may <laughs> be able to generate more new ideas, right? Uh, so, but in... Um, in a video conferencing application, we see down here, we are just looking at each other for hours, less movement, sedentary lifestyle, not good, right? Now, I want to now talk about um, how much data actually used in a one hour video conference meeting, or one conference, uh, one hour video conferencing uh, lecture or sessions, right? Uh, let's say your, your quality of the Zoom is approximately about high, High definition, right? you, uh, usually it's just a high definition. Your download speed is about 450 megabytes. Huh? Upload speed is about uh, 360 about, to 400 megabytes. So total is about 800, right? 800. But uh, the, the reviews in one of the uh, sites that I've put, uh, I, I found is that if you turn off your, your video, video feed, your video camera, huh? your Zoom data will drop huh? because the, your upload, your upload, uh, size actually reduced by at least 30%, okay? So that is also another consideration that when we uh, decide whether we want to ask our students to turn on or turn off the camera or not. Um, it's also because of the, uh, the, the amount of bandwidth that we use. So uh, the, the advice is that we don't share our screen longer than it's necessary. We only share screen uh, when, it's, when we want to ask questions because it take up more data, okay? But of course, uh, there's also a, I also noticed a phenomenon uh, um, that when uh, our students, you ask them to pass up assignment, right? Suddenly they will say, uh, date due, assignment date due. Then they will say, uh, oh, internet connection poor, um, problem with the internet, computer breakdown, and so on. Or oh, there may be genuine case. Uh, I'm, I'm not making a generalization, but just, just um, there may be some cases here. So if you ask the student uh, this question, is your internet connection good? This, uh, to me, is a very general question. It's not going to give you any meaningful uh, information. I will compare with uh, YouTube videos huh? uh, because uh, uh, 720 megapixel YouTube quality yeah, uh, will take up about 870, which is equivalent to the Zoom video one hour. Huh? Uh, a standard definition of 480 uh, pixels uh, take about 264 uh, megabytes. So rather than asking your students, do you have good internet connection? I think it's a, a better question would be, uh, are you able to watch YouTube video? So if they are able to watch YouTube videos, um, they should be able to join your class uh, <laughs> through Zoom. At least uh, turn off the camera, uh, then it will take about... Uh, at least cut half from the about the 810 megabytes, maybe about just about 400 uh, 
uh, megabytes. Uh. So I think that that you compare with the with YouTube videos. Can they watch YouTube videos? If they can watch YouTube videos, I think they should be able to use Zoom. Uh. That's my whole point. Now, the next thing I want to share is uh, this. Uh. Um, just a general remarks here. Uh, Bolcher and Conrad in 2016, they said that there are five general changing life, uh, teaching, teaching and learning trends uh, that is uh, afforded by online platform today eh, in this digital era. Number one is that uh, our role as a faculty member to shift more of uh, a coach, uh, more to coaching, guiding and mentoring rather than giving uh, lectures, right? And we know this already, okay? We know that uh, lectures are actually a very passive way of uh, engaging our students, right? Um, I'm gonna talk more about this later. Number two is that uh, the learners are more active in directing their own learning, okay? They can actually curate their own learning content as well. They can they can be part of four curators. They can add content, okay? They, they shape their own journeys together with us. We are like a guide, we guide them. Number three is the content resources are very flexible now. It's almost virtually infinite because you can find so much content in the internet, YouTube, right? Your 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 content outlines, your your course outlines, all those you don't change, but the content, the specific content itself, they can change, right? And can be go up to date uh, from year to year. Number four is that a learning environment, uh, this is what according to the author says, uh, is primarily asynchronous and occasionally synchronous activities, which means that you don't really have everybody must come together. They, of course, there are certain situations that they, you have to come together in giving a lecture. Number five is that assessment can be more continuous now than ever, right? Um, we can have quiz, live quiz with them, we can have a forum with them and, and so in so many ways because it's the the, the platform has just enabled us to diversify the way we implement assessment now in so many ways right uh, I just want to talk specifically on the first point just now huh, on this on the uh, um, faculty roles now have changed to a more of a coach or a mentor or a, a guide right now why, why do I want to say this because I, I think that um, now we, we know the problem of, of lecture, okay? We know that in most lectures, learners are very passive for higher order thinking. Um, they usually just passively uh, sit down and listen, absorb, and uh, our attention span is very short, right? If you more than 20 minutes, then they begin to fall asleep. And it's I mean, estimated that an average medical student from my faculty, yeah, uh, not my, we don't know, we haven't done a study here, but um, it's been shown that a, an average medical student will set through 1,800 lectures uh, in the course of their studies in the five-year program. Can you imagine that uh, they sit through 1,800 lectures, so many lectures. I have I have been a medical student for five years. Actually, I don't remember almost anything <laughs> of what my lecturers have said during the lectures, except for those very exceptional ones. They are, uh, presentation are very beautiful the slides. Last time they don't use a PowerPoint slide, uh, they use the OHP. And some of, I remember one of my lecturers is drawn a very nice uh, slide, you know, they can flip on, flip off with that transparency. Uh, those are the things that you, you remember, you, I, I remember well. And also some of the jokes, uh, uh, then you'll remember. But other than that, you just don't really remember much, right? Uh, you will look at the book by Donald Bly, uh, and he asked a question, Back in 1998, um, he said, um, if we look at all the studies uh, looking at uh, the usefulness of, of uh, lectures compared to other uh, ways of delivering uh, teaching and learning activities. Uh, 18 studies show that lectures, lectures are worse, right? Uh, five studies say there are no difference between lectures and other ways of delivering the teaching and learning. And there are no studies uh, that show that lecture is better. Of, of course, I'm not saying that lectures are bad. Huh? Uh, lecture still has its own place. Okay, it's uh, it's still a, a good way. It's a very economical way of delivering a standard uh, message, right? A conveying uh, information to a large group of students is a is a is a very economical and efficient way, right? It's uh, cheap. Rather than you know you uh, do a one-to-one 
teaching uh, is time consuming, it's very uh, it's a lot of labor, okay, very labor intensive. And lecture can provide like an entry, right? It's like an introduction to a very difficult topic. Uh, these are the main points you, that you can tell our students and we can guide our students so that they can go back and read further on it. Right? So, and also to, to, to throw out some uh, thought provoking questions and discussion. So lecture has its own place when it is used appropriately. Now, why I want to bring this up is that as, uh, to tie up with the first point that I mentioned earlier on, the five changing trends, right? One of the trends is that faculty should be more uh, changing to the role of more of a guide uh, and a mentor to facilitate the deeper uh, engagement, right? Uh, to, to facilitate higher order thinking. Um, I, I'm afraid uh, uh, with the use of video conferencing, we are actually still doing lectures. It's just that we are changing, we are transporting, uh, giving lecture face-to-face -face in a real lecture hall to giving lecture uh, in a virtual video conferencing. Uh, but it's still lectures, really. It's just that we are changing uh, different platforms from a physical face-to-face -face platform to a virtual platform, but it's still lectures. So if you are not careful, that, that, is, that is not uh, e-learning all about. It's not about, this is not online learning all about. Online learning is not about just uh, giving lectures, just changing the way of giving lectures from uh, physical to virtual. So I think we still have to uh, have this kind of reflection. Of course, the easiest way, uh, actually myself also very guilty, is just to give the lecture uh, uh, through Zoom. It's much faster, it's easier, rather than think about how I'm going to engage the students. But again, this is something that we should think uh, as a part of our reflection, whether we are actually uh, abuse, <laughs> I'm sorry to use the word, abusing the platforms or not, but we are still giving lectures. Huh? Of course, we have to be aware of uh, Dr. Fox effects. Huh? I'm not sure whether anybody has heard of Dr. Fox effect. Dr. Fox effect, <clears throat> it was uh, performed in 1970. Uh, it is University of Southern California School of Medicine, actually in, in the medical setting. Uh, they gave it to a classroom of medical students and a PhD students. Uh. Um, this Dr. Fox is actually not a real lecturer. He was just an actor, but he has been trained to give lecture. Uh, so he had been trained, he, he practiced many times until he was as, as fluent as the real lecturer. Okay, so after the end of the lecture, and he gave a topic that is very strange and something that is a, a topic that is not, uh, that the students are not familiar. Okay? Mathematical game theory as applied to physician education. It's just gibberish. They just uh, smooth talk, but it doesn't have much content. But at the end, then they asked the students to rate uh, how much they like this Dr. Fox. And they say that Dr. Fox gave lecture, very, very good lecture, right? So you can see that um, you don't have to be a content expert to give a good lecture. You just have to practice many times and you can be a Dr. Fox. So you have to be very careful of Dr. Fox effect. Huh? A good lecture doesn't mean that uh, you is an efficient way of, of learning, right? It's just a very entertaining way of learning. Okay, last point I want to share is um, having talked about the good point, the and, the, and some of the bad points, ugly things about virtual conferencing applications and how it's so unnatural in terms of the communication um, uh, skills that we have been taught all the while, that we have been, as human, the, the way we interact with one another is a bit unnatural for us. And also uh, how we may unconsciously abuse uh, the uh, virtual uh, platform, especially video conferencing. I think we should also um, take some time to reflect uh, what type of platform you want to use, whether you want to use synchronous or asynchronous learning. Um, a number of uh, papers have shown that uh, asynchronous learning, because of the time lapse, uh, allows for actually deeper engagement right, with the students because it gives time for students to, to reflect, to be more explicit uh, in order to shape the content better. Right? So, I also uh, shown that uh, I've shown some questions in uh, um, uh, this uh, elite right uh, learning platform, um, and uh, the answer that I gave uh, not the, sorry the answer that I received from the students are yeah it, it, it 
show the maturity, uh, but it's just that students need some time to think. So you, that's what you expect. We expected the students to be to have a, a more critical answer, deeper uh, answers, you know, uh, answer that re reflect their maturity uh, in uh, asynchronous learning. So in, in that sense, uh, asynchronous learning is better because it gives them the time to reflect time that they can come up with a really good answer, right? So the questions that are really, we really need to ask ourselves are the reflection questions here is that when we want to use an online uh, 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 synchronous uh, learning, where we want to engage the students using video conferencing, when we talk about synchronous, usually we talk about video conferencing application using Zoom. Uh, uh, we seldom use, uh, we seldom do synchronous learning using uh, just text messaging, right? Like Telegram and uh, 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 WhatsApp. We can, but it's not rich. Yeah. But um, when you talk about synchronous, it usually is either one of the video applications, right? And we already know that it, it actually consumes quite quite a lot of bandwidth, right? I, I've, I've already shown you the table. So I think that the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what are the activities that must be, the keyword is that it must be done via synchronous teachings only but cannot be conducted via asynchronous teaching. If those activities that can be conducted via, uh, via asynchronous uh, uh, teaching platforms, uh, like forum and all, and pre-recorded pre videos that they can view uh, on their own, why not we do it asynchronous, asynchronously? Um, but there are some of the activities that must be done via synchronous activities, uh, via synchronous platforms. So maybe we should, uh, if, if I can invite the participants to share their thoughts, what are the activities you think that cannot be done via asynchronous teachings, but must be done via synchronous teachings? Adoda, Azra, do, do we see any response? Maybe you can. Not Although, yet. Not yet. Let me give some time to think about this question, because I also seldom think about this. Of course, the easiest one is just give the lecture and get it done. But I think I think if you want to really uh, make full use of it and use it appropriately, uh, where where we only use it when really is necessary, okay, and we don't really don't really abuse it, um, then I think this is the question that we should ask ourselves: uh, What are activities that we must do it via synchronous teachings, but cannot be done via synchronous? Is, is there any response? Not yet. Also, yeah, yeah. Let me let, 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 let the the participants can continue to think of this and and uh, respond uh, even after this. Okay. Now this is just uh, some of the references um, for this presentation. I think it's just part of it. Some of the references already inside the slide itself. Uh, I think that's all I want to share. Uh, we have uh, uh, some somebody, uh, Prof. Gabriel from the chat room. Uh, she mm. said that maybe when you include Mentimeter. Yeah, that's the reason. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, yeah, Mentimeter, Mentimeter is also a, a good, a good uh, interactive tools uh, with, with the students. In fact, not just Mentimeter, you can also have a poll everywhere and uh, AHA slides and some, and there, are few, uh, there are a few applications. Uh. I initially, actually, I, 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 I have these questions in Mentimeter, actually. I, I thought that asking people to switch from PowerPoint and then after that to turn on their yeah, web browser and response and we only we only have about 30 plus plus participants thing um we, we don't want to have the task switching so many times and so we just respond through the chat box yeah i think so uh mentimeter and all these platforms are also a good way to make it more interactive uh then it's not not so boring uh, the lectures yeah and then we have uh, from uh, Dr. Freddy, uh, do you think mathematical subjects can be taught asynchronously? Um, okay, let, let me try to put it to my own context. Okay, there are some um, part of uh, the medi uh, medical curriculum will also requires calculation. So uh, calculation, calculation of the drugs and all. Uh, we can do... Okay, let's say talking about own, my own personal uh, context. I can uh, pre-record a, a work, work example on how to do a calculation of how much drugs uh, infusion 
uh, post it online and then give the students um, and a question, a similar question, a similar question, but in a different uh, setting or something like that. Right. So that that can be done from from my from my from my perspective. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, probably uh, some of the concept may be too difficult to do an asynchronous. So I, I agree with Dr. Freddy. Maybe these are the areas that you know if it's uh, too complex, uh, and then it should be done in a synchronous way. So, yeah. So that is one of the good example that you use it appro appropriately. Mm. We have from Dr. Kartini, uh, those activities that have to be shown or demonstrate, or if you need to further elaborate or explain important keywords or terminology. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But again, you know, uh, maybe we can still also explain it in an asynchronous manner through platform, or we can record the videos, or uh, do a short podcast mm -hmm. audio to explain it further. So I think there are two ways. Uh, there's no right, right, wrong answers, or perhaps to answer some Q and A platforms until Q and A after, after they have viewed the lectures, and then they the, the the synchronous one is to 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 more of an interactive dialogue. If the students have any uh, theories uh, or con confuse confusion con confusing terminologies or or concepts that they find difficult to understand. Yeah. We have also from Prof. Gabriel also, synchronous is good for, for small groups like PBL, but not necessary for large classes. Yeah, I agree also. Yeah. If a, a large group, myself, we just pre-record a, a lecture. And if the lecture is too long, uh, then we break the lecture into maybe a 15 minutes sections. Yeah, part A, part B, then you can review it. After part A, then give them some questions, then part B, then give them some questions. Yeah. Let's go back to the, the one that I mentioned earlier on about giving lecture. It's still giving lecture, actually, it's just that we change it from giving lecture in a real uh, physical work lecture hall into a video conference application. And also from Dr. Freddy, also, some software application needed in a course also very difficult to teach asynchronously. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, we need to explain. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, Prof, I would like to ask how online learning is being conducted, especially when practical session is needed in Faculty of Medicine? Okay, that is a very challenging thing for us to do. Uh, especially in, um, especially for clinical examinations, right? Because clinical examinations that is require human interactions. Uh, medical student and patient interactions, right? So you need to uh, palpate for the pulse, you need to listen to the heartbeats, uh, the heart sounds, you need to listen to the lung sounds and detect abnormalities and all that. That is very, very hard to simulate. Um, you know, that has been a challenge for us for the one whole year. I can just tell you that. I also haven't thought about how to, how to do it. We can use some kind of... Uh, mannequin and simulated models uh, that's one way uh, but that there, there are some simulated high-end very high fidelity models and simulated models that can actually mimic sounds uh, uh, real you can actually feel on the plastic mannequin the pulse and all those things and irregular pulse okay, as well but it's very very, very expensive uh, so that's been a challenge the other way that we taught them at, at, at least they can learn about the techniques of examination first and then they examine on one another yeah, their, their classmates, their roommates. Huh? So I examining, I examine your, your your eyes, and then you examine my eyes. That kind of thing. So this is what we have been teaching our students to do. Okay, and then uh, one more question. So how can we maintain the quality of our exam paper if take home test exam is being conducted as our final exam? Again, get the question. Uh, how can we maintain the quality of our exam paper, especially when our uh, when the final exam is being conducted uh, with uh, via tech home test, something like that? Mm. Mm. How to maintain the quality? Because the mentioned... student will uh, always uh, copy because that one is a synchronous tech home test. So how can we maintain it, the yeah. quality of the final exam? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Like this. Um. In. Uh. I. 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 I still believe that take home exams and uh, you know, open book exam. You know, that, that has its role. 
but we 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 make application type of questions uh, uh, rather than a simple type of report you know how they apply the knowledge into it but it, it can also be an open book and within that two hours you must do it so even if it's open book if you don't know where to find the information you, you also won't be able to um, create good answers of course uh, the other thing is that we have to check the answers with one another to make sure they are not direct copy and copy it from one another uh, so i think that has uh, for continuous assessment that is part of the formative assessment uh, as i mentioned I, I think now the trend is not put all your assessment basket just to borrow the concept from investment right so I'll tell you that don't put all your eggs into one basket or investment all your money into one basket and similarly you don't put all your assessment invested into one final exam and that was a mistake that we made and i, I really explained it to the faculty i hope that they also accept it because now the trend is that we go uh, a number of data points along the way to see the maturity of our students whether the students have actually achieved their uh, their learning objectives along their journey or not because you see that you see the problem is that uh, in medical faculty they have one final professional exams and this final profession is very important if you uh, fail the final professional exam that you you have to repeat again so the problem is that if you if because the disruption for example this pandemic disrupted the physical examination the clinical examination part of the final exam then what happened <laughs> how can we we, we we have we have alternatives huh? we are alternative we ask uh, we do stimulated patients we do a uh, uh, kind of uh, decision making questions uh, scenario based and although but it's still different uh, it's still different as compared to a real uh, examining a patients in front of you so um i don't have a straightforward answer but the concept is that we, we need to diversify our assessment portfolios and how we examine our our students if we have enough data points along their journeys for the five years journey then that final exam is just one additional component as compared uh, in addition to the all the data points that we already have for students and then we already know that these students deserve to pass or not the question is that can i decide uh, whether these students should be passed or not, even without the component, the clinical component of the final exam. If yes, means I'm quite confident that because I have enough backup of all the data points of all the results that the students have been gone through, then uh, you know I have my evidence to show that these students have passed. They, they, the final exam is just an additional point. I think that that should be the way to move forward, and that is a. Also, the way that uh, medical education is moving forward now in to globally, I'm talking about globally here, right? Uh, they do this. The concept here is called a programmatic assessment. And this is what we should be doing, actually. If we put all our hope into one final exam, that is too too dangerous. Uh, if it if it's disrupted, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have from the Freddy again. I agree with Prof Chiu. Application questions only allowed. So it, it is okay to have few simple questions, but big chunk of the mark should be application questions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I think uh, any more questions from the chat room? No more idea. <laughs> so with that, I think, okay, so we can, uh, if there is no question, so I would like to conclude, Prof, our workshop for today. So we hope that uh, you found the sharing available for you to develop your own teaching portfolio. So we hope that you will be getting some inspirations to conducting your online teaching and learning. So thank you very much, Prof, and all the speakers and also all the participants. And then uh, see you in our next Dr. workshop. Dr. Azra? Yes? Yes, can I say something? Yes, boleh. <laughs> Hi, Prof Chiu. Hi, Dr. Tatini. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, I joined a bit late, uh, but um, I would just like to uh, say thank you very much to uh, speakers today, Prof Chiu, uh, Cik Muhammad Azri, and also Cik Muhammad Farid for the sharing. Lah. Okay, because um, through the sharing, actually, um, we at least have an idea on how different faculties, different fields, um implement uh, either a synchronous or synchronous uh, way of uh, teaching uh, online um, so if there is any um, uh, 
different ways of, you know, there's various ways uh, mm. for us to use the available tools out there kind, um, to, to help uh, engage the students, to help making sure that uh, whatever content that you wanted to deliver or learning unit uh, outcomes that you wanted to achieve uh, uh, is achieved. Um, so um, all the points that you have given, the, the part that <laughs> I've managed to, to get at the end is, is, is true. It's quite interesting where you can't just assume that uh, when you give lectures uh, and, uh, and a good one, uh, uh, that you are um, a good, a good academician, mm -hmm. a good lecturer. So you have to do other, other things as well to make sure that uh, the students over there uh, get the learning, mm. <laughs> the learning that you should yeah, that, that should have. Yeah. Right? Uh, so because because you can't just measure by uh, just um, just by giving giving lectures. Uh, even on online learning, sometimes we 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 also do or or uh, used to give lectures even in online you know mm. uh, we, we keep the traditional happens even in online yeah where uh to laugh, where actually we have to find a way to uh, use the technology uh, mm. as a tool to assist us to plan for uh, a, a, an effective uh, teaching and learning delivery so yeah. uh, i would like to say congratulations and thank you very much lah, for the support that um, all the speakers have mm. given to come as well lah. Mm. to actually provide um, uh, a good alternative for mm. the other academicians as well. So thank you for the particip participation from everyone as well, uh, giving the support. Okay, we have 27, 20, 20, 20 something participants today. Um, and we encourage you to continue to give support to come as well. We have a lot of webinars after this as well, kan, Dr. Azra? So do join us. And for those, uh, I think today's uh, session is also recorded. For those who not be able to join previous previous session, ada beberapa session yang webinar yang very interesting, menarik, such as collaborative, kan? How to do collaborative uh, in, in, in virtual, I mean, uh, engagement, those kind of things using Discord, other tools that you might be able to implement as well in your class. Depends lah macam mana you nak deli, uh, rancangan you lah kan. So uh, you can refer to our YouTube channel uh, for yeah. that recorded session. Uh, thank you again, yeah, Prof. Ju. Tadi Encik Muhammad Azri Bani Kasih. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't describe much of the web tools here because I think uh -uh. previous we got already taught a lot of the how to do it and all the various web tools. Mine is more of a reflection of what I think. Yes. Uh, yeah, but so sometimes we have to reflect because after doing all this online, the, the master semester kedua kan, sometimes we have to step back kan, and take a look uh, yeah. what is actually, actually um, we, we think about teaching, learning, uh, reflective yeah. on. Yeah, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite different. Like you, have to, you have to know what is your goals uh, at the end of the day lah, uh, yeah. and the learners uh, from the perspective of the learners as well. Yeah. Right. So thank you. Okay. Um. So I think that's it, uh, Dr. Azra. Um. Yeah, so you. yeah. See you again in the next okay. seminar, yeah, guys. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Okay. All right. I have to do like this to show that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the non-verbal cues. Huh? Non okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye.